Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Today we'll be talking about a couple of very interesting developments. One is about the offensive of the Turkish forces inside the northern Syria, where the most interesting part is that initially when they moved in, they wanted to in fact have a buffer zone of around 18 miles all throughout uh, that particular border. And they wanted to flush out uh, the Quds from there and all those non-state actors which are fighting against uh, Turkey, whether they are from PKK or other groups. The Americans at the same time also said that they will withdraw their 1,000 troops and eventually uh, this is the matter between Turkey and Syria and they should sort it out amongst themselves. Now, since Russia is a very important player in the region, so the case is with Syria and now Turkey. You talk about Saudi Arabia, you talk about Iran, you talk about America. So it's a very complex situation out there. Lots of people have been killed. Turkish soldiers has also died in the conflict there. But now there is this situation where a lot of people are moving out, especially the Kurds. And uh, since they do not have a choice, so they're just vacating just to save their lives. But that is a very important development because the offensive had stopped earlier on the demand of the Americans so that these people can... Uh, withdraw and can go back but certainly after three or four days it started again couple of developments regarding the Afghan peace process as we all know now the four members will meet again including Pakistan Russia China and USA to sort out the issue Pakistan has been recognized now as one of the most important players in sorting out the Afghan issue and at the same time having said that uh, the new uh, Secretary of Defense of United States of America Mr. Uh, as Perb was in uh, Afghanistan on Sunday, we met the president and also other senior officials to sort out the situation. Now, if you remember earlier, a uh, few weeks earlier than that, uh, if you remember, Mr. Donald Trump, the president of USA, had announced the withdrawal and he has also said uh, that uh, we will now uh, stop the negotiation process. Now, what will be the terms and conditions for the next course of action? That is, again, something pretty important. We'll be talking about that in detail. Uh, but let me first introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio on my right is Air Vice Marshal Retired, uh, Faiz Amir Saab. Faiz Saab is uh, a senior analyst and also the Vice Chancellor of Air University, Islamabad. So thank you very much. And we have with us uh, Dr. Nazir Mahmood Saab. He's a senior columnist, is also a writer, a journalist. Sir. Thank you very much. And we have with us... Uh, Dr. Professor Rifat Hussain Saab, Senior Strategic Analyst and Expert on International Relations. Dr. Saab, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Avim Saab, let's start off from uh, this Turkey-Syria issue, sir. Initially, sir, a very hardcore offensive was launched by the Turkish forces with all the guns blazing using the artillery, the Air Force and the other military tools. And they were able to flush out the Kurds to a certain level now. And they want to have that 18-mile corridor, sir. And surprisingly, the Americans, they said that they will withdraw their 1,000 <coughs> uh, 1, troops stationed out there. Now you're also looking at the tactical weapons which are stationed there and the withdrawal, the time frame and multiple other issues. And obviously the balance of power, sir. Initially the same Kurds were supported by the Americans, equipped, financed, and everything was given. Uh, to them to, to fight against the uh, op opposite forces. Now, don't you think, sir, the alignments are changing within Syria and at the same time, when you look at it at a larger, uh, from, from larger perspective, sir, even the alignments, when you talk about Turkey being a NATO member, but technically speaking, at the same time, USA was saying that if you do not stop the offensive, we might put you under certain restrictions. So, it's pretty fluid, it's pretty... I mean, confusing at the same time. So, your take? It's pretty complicated and pretty tragic for the people of that area. But it is important to understand the uh, uh, arrangement of the forces in that area. Turkey has a problem with the uh, PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, that occupies the south of Tur uh, Turkey. Turkey has uh, very cordial relationships with the Kurds in the Iraq the KRG, the Kurdish regional government that was formed uh, after the uh, United States uh, uh, invaded Iraq to throw out, to, uh, to, to topple our, for a regime change against Saddam Hussein. And this, the Kurds supported the American offensive. Now, uh, Turkey also has uh, allies in Syria itself. 
the Syrian Kurds were part of a larger coalition of groups that were fighting uh, against the ISIS. And they were also fighting against the Syrian government. Now, this Syrian National Council, as they call the opposition forces, they also have plenty of Kurds with them. Syrian National Council was formed in Turkey. So there's a lot of uh, uh, confusion going on. Turkey supports the Kurds in Iraq. Uh, if you remember Masoud Barzani, so they had a very uh, friendly relationship. They were supportive of uh, Masoud Barzani and the Kurds because they were opposed to the Kurds in Syria. So that makes the entire situation very uh, complex as far as the Kurdish problem is concerned. Now, S Turkey also has refugees that have traveled from uh, uh, Syria, Syria all the way, up, all the way up to, million. To, to Turkey. Turkey also wants those people to come back, but the Kur Syrian Kurds would not let them come back. So what actually is happening is that uh, Sir Turkey is pushing... Now, sir, these are the refugees. What's, what's the problem with the Syrian Kurds? Why aren't they letting them come back and... You know, and be in their own country, sir. Syrian Kurds are uh, aligned with the PKK, PKK in Turkey. So, uh, and that is Turkey, an opposing body. And, and Turkey, Turkey considers them a terrorist group. It's just like Pakistan and TTP for that matter. Yeah. So, so, so Turkey considers them a terrorist group. And recently, Trump also tweeted that the Kurds are not angels. Absolutely. And they also have terrorists amongst them. So that is the issue that... But a year they, earlier, if you remember, sir, he used to, you know, praise them. They, they, were, they were fighting for, for, for on exactly. behalf of them. So, so Donald Trump Syria, betrayed them, sir? Donald Trump betrayed them? This is what, actually, what those Kurds are thinking at the moment. I mean, if you listen to their the, interviews, they what, say, well, you know, he has left us whatever in the middle the, of nowhere. Whatever the uh, world may think, uh, Trump is playing as all the optics for his elections. He promised to pull out his troops from um, from Syria, Syria from uh, from uh, Afghanistan. So, at the first step, whatever troops were left in Syria, he has pulled them out and they have started to withdraw. And that vacuum that was created over there, Turkey found it a opportune moment to push its peri perimeter of security well 30 kilometers into into Syria. Now, here the situation comes a bit more tricky. Today, uh, yesterday. Russia and Turkey uh, uh, agreed on that both of them will push the Kurds, Syrian Kurds into Syria, 30 kilometers from Syrian border, and they will have a joint patrolling, the uh, Russian forces and the Turkish forces. Joint patrolling all along that all along border? The, all along the border. Okay. That, that so they'll Turkey be having that 30 kilometer or the 18 mile buffer zone. And that Turkey mm -hmm. claims will give an opportunity to the, uh, to the refugees in Turkey to come back. So while the Kurds would have gone 30 kilometers inside, the refugees would have come back to the area. S Turkey would have secured its own border with, with uh, Syria. The funny situation or a very interesting situation here is that Russia that supports the Syrian government of Ashar uh, Asad. Asad, Asad, it is gone in, 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 in agreement with, with Turkey to secure the Turkish border. Whom are they siding with? So, I mean, and, and, uh, just, or are they just looking after their own interests primarily? Everybody is out there for their own interests. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, uh, Bashar al-Assad gave a statement yesterday that they will support the Kurds fighting against the Turkey. So while there's a, there's a, t Russia has a relationship with both Bashar al-Assad and Turkey, Bashar al-Assad forces would fight against Russian forces or against the, the agreement, agreed forces that will patrol uh, with the help of the Kurd, Syrian Kurds. So this situation is quite, quite uh, complicated. You, you can see a, a prolonged area of low intensity conflict over there, where probably when the, uh, where the Turkish forces, when they, they uh, establish a perimeter of security for right. their own country, they'll be attacked by the Kurds and the Syrian forces from uh, uh, the other side. Now, sir, once the American forces would withdraw with all their fighting power and everything. The balance of power within that region is definitely going to change. Alignments have changed. Now, no matter what sort of a support the Syrian army can give uh, to the Kurds, but it won't be much against the Russians or, or, or the Turkish for that matter. They are full-fledged military forces and they have a certain design in their, in their mind. 
that vacuum is that going to be the real problem sir well um, as we just discussed that vacuum is being filled by russia and that was i think very prompt uh, reaction from uh, vladimir putin russian president who uh, met with uh, the turkish president in sochi in, in russia and they concluded this agreement just yesterday and as uh, uh, today the details have come out uh, according to those details uh, the vacuum that was left by the united states is being filled by and they have agreed that the turkish forces and the russian forces and the syrian forces also all of them will be guarding the border so syrian government has not opposed uh, this agreement not as yet though syria was not a party ideally syria should have been invited to this agreement because essentially turkey and russia were discussing territory within syria so why syria was not invited so th this is a question but russia is saying that uh, the syrian government is uh, in contact with us and they have agreed to it and if they have agreed then this is a major step forward and as we know that uh, putin and russia is trying to assert uh, russia as once again a superpower or at least a major power in that region so um, i think this is a significant development mm -hmm. and uh, having said this i think that it was united states that once again pushed that region into a new conflagration uh, not only usa withdrew but initially president trump gave this assurance to turkey that if they take action and if they uh, establish this buffer zone mind you uh, erdogan has been asking for that uh, buffer zone for for many years now at least two years he has been calling for and for the past six months he was very demanding that you know european union and the united states and the primary reason for that is to relocate all the refugees in that area correct sir well this is partly true partly true that's what they are saying but, but primarily it is for the security and safety of turkey two two reasons there are in fact three reasons <laughs> one is of course repatriation of uh, refugees uh, three to four million refugees are there and uh, uh, turkey is saying that we want them at least part of it at least a million to go back and settle in that that region this is one second reason is uh, the turkey is claiming that constantly this ypg this is people's protection unit which is uh, an ally so to say a counterpart of kpk uh, pkk in turkey so this ypg in syria kurdish force in syria with uh, pkk in turkey they are creating according to turkish version they are creating problems for turkish government and it is not new it has been going on for long so and the they are all over europe just starting from norway to germany to elsewhere and the kind of yes. money so they're the accumulating second, primarily i mean every third taxi driver in, in europe is, is, is a kurd yes so the second reason is that they want to uh, turkey wants the border to be protected and the turkey does not want that any kurdish intervention or support to pkk within within turkey this is second and the third is also turkish internal politics because as we know that you know in turkey also erdogan's popularity is sliding he is no more the popular leader that he was he has been ruling for almost two decades now 20 years almost and after to end after you this you think the graph has gone down oh yes so but and this happened in russia also so you know when these leaders they take these actions when putin does that or erdogan does that there is a domestic dimension these decisions are not that also. popular yes so they want to assert and they want to tell their people that you know internationally we are we can do things now sir if you allow me we've been joined in by hasan abdullah sahab he's a correspondent of uh, trt television uh, turkey and let's get the latest update from the gentleman assalamu alaikum hasan sir um, uh, for talking to us first of all hasan what's the latest update regarding this um, issue between syria and turkey well, the latest is we've just heard from the Turkish Defense Ministry saying that uh, they've put a monitoring mechanism in place uh, to make sure that uh, the assurance they've received from the United States that the YPG has withdrawn from the area that's going to constitute the safe zone is true. Uh, because the Americans have written to the Turks saying that uh, the YPG has completely withdrawn from there. Uh, the Turkish Defense Ministry is saying that they can't confirm whether that's happened at the moment. Uh, the Turkish Defense Ministry is saying that some YPG elements have uh, put on the uniforms of the um, Syrian army and they're trying to sort of mingle and give the perception that this is the army of Bashar al-Assad and not YPG. So they're saying that if 
uh, that is the case and that's going to be unacceptable to Turkey. And uh, this is something the Turkish government is trying to work out at the moment. And sir, what, what sort of an understanding uh, you think Bashar al-Assad has with Mr. Tayyab Erdogan regarding this conflict, sir? Have they spoken any details regarding that? Well, uh, there, there's been no direct contact as far as I'm aware. I've been talking to uh, a number of Turkish officials, including uh, President Erdogan's chief foreign policy advisor, Ibrahim Kalin. I had a detailed chat with him. Uh, there is no direct contact between Ankara and Damascus at the moment. There has been some back-channel diplomacy. Uh, Ibrahim Kalin told me that uh, the official position, uh, the principal position of Turkey is still the same in terms of uh, you know, re regarding Bashar al-Assad, the main cause uh, for the deaths of some half a million Syrians. Uh, but um, what Turkish officials have been saying is that Turkey is willing to consider all the pragmatic options on the table as long as it helps um, in dealing with the national security concern of Turkey and also dealing with the refugee crisis, which obviously, which obviously ties in with uh, some economic concerns of Turkey. You know, when it comes to the economic well-being of Turkey, sir, what we, we have witnessed earlier, when the Turkish authorities they shut down a jet of Russia, there was a lot of direct conflict. We were thinking about uh, uh, the remittances which used to come from uh, Russia to Turkey or the 10 billion or maybe the 12 billion dollar worth of business and trade imports and tourism and so on and so forth. I mean, and on top, there were a lot of bomb blasts, if you remember, in Istanbul and, and Ankara and a couple of other uh, cities as well. I mean, that was a shock for Turkey. Is Turkey ready? For something of that sort now, sir? Well, first of all, as far as the trade volume is concerned, we heard from President Erdogan yesterday in Sochi. He said that the trade volume has gone up. Uh, it at the moment stands at uh, 25, $25.5 billion between Russia and Turkey. That's the bilateral trade volume. And they've set a target of $100 billion. Obviously, that will take some time before they reach that. But tourism, for example, from Russia has been going up. They've been working on visa liberalization mechanism and so forth. Um, there is obviously this concern of, um, you know, a sort of asymmetrical warfare being waged against Turkey. And um, the Turkish, for example, even on Fridays outside mosques in Turkey, you don't normally see the sort of security you may see in some other countries. But uh, last Friday, we did witness a substantial overt security and you know random checking and so forth this is not something that's been the norm in turkey so officials here are saying that they are anticipating you know possible terrorist attacks and it's something they're prepared for all right thank you very much Hassan. now sir uh, first of all <clears throat> definitely your take on the previous point sir and now moving forward also sir when you when you look at uh, turkey and its role and and then you have to see the role of iran also that has been very vital sir they've always been supporting the the Syrian regime and they were very much on the same page uh, with the uh, Russian authorities as well sir regarding the Syrian issue but now sir it seems that you know uh, it, there, there's a confusion because everybody is looking after their own interest and they have moved away from their previous stances the presence of the Russian president in Saudi Arabia sir how important was that because we haven't heard much coming from Saudi Arabia regarding this well, and Saudi Arabia is definitely a very important player in the region, the, sir. Uh, with regard to uh, Putin's visit to Saudi Arabia, uh, the Saudi Arabians went out of their way. They rolled out a red carpet for him uh, and they signed uh, multi-billion uh, petro agreements with, the, uh, with, uh, with Moscow. And there was a promise that the Russian will be also selling arms to, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, it was a great uh, moment of triumph for Putin, whom the Americans have been trying to marginalize as far as Putin's presence inside uh, Middle East or the inside Middle East, the conflict zones is present. Uh, see, the, uh, the, they struck a deal with, with Syria and they have also strengthened their position vis-a-vis vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis Iraq. So, in this uh, emerging scenario, to me, uh, the clear winner of all these geopolitical moves that we have been discussing, if you look at the internal mosaic of the, the countries and the problems of the Kurdistan, Russia comes out as a clear winner. And along with this, this the, the, uh, the, uh, the Syrian 
and the uh, the uh, Turkish uh, agreement with the with Russia uh, is a uh, is is quite breathtaking, given the fact that they have carved out a uh, not only a 48 mile uh, long uh, uh, joint patrolling area, uh, which is only about 18 miles, but then there is, there is a uh, agreement between the two countries that the uh, that the area which was directly under the control of the Turks will remain with, the, with Turkey, even though in the agreement there is a reference to the unlawful presence of the foreign invaders. So the question is that when would the, uh, this, uh, this uh, de facto or de jure control of this area would be transferred back to Turkey, that's one. The other problem is, is a much significant problem because you mentioned Iran. Uh, the Kurdistan problem is as old as the collapse of the Ottoman Empire is concerned. Kurds have been uh, looking for uh, help to, uh, to uh, establish their Kurdistan state and which... The Americans always favored them. Americans favored them, but now as a result of uh, uh, Trump's uh, decision to withdraw American troops uh, from the uh, from this uh, so-called safe zone, the entire area has been destabilized. So, the, uh, as Mandesab mentioned, the Russians have moved in, and the Turkey uh, has consolidated its presence along this uh, 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 joint patrolling area. So, I think uh, the the now the Kurds, the Syrian Kurds who were who have been asked to vacate this area, and there was some reference to the verification of conflicting claims, whether they have vacated those areas or there are some Kurdish, pre, uh, Kurdish presence uh, inside, in, inside that safe zone. Uh, so regardless of whether those verification claims are true or not, but the fact remains that Turkey has consolidated its military presence all along the vulnerable Turkish border where they think that the Kurds could be a potential problem for them. Dr. Sam, if you remember, <clears throat> the, the Americans had something of this sort in their mind that they will be dividing Iraq into three portions. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the eastern, or you, let's put it, the southeastern portion, the majority uh, Shia, and then you have the uh, southwestern side that is going to be the majority Sunni, and then on top, the northern part is about the Kurd, right, sir? But obviously, it, it is going to take a chunk away from Iraq. It is going to chunk, take a chunk away from Syria also. Maybe these countries wouldn't like that. But yes, yes. where is that formula and what would be the future of Kurds now? Sir? Well, nobody's thinking on those lines. Un unfortunately, <laughs> Kurds have to live with their scattered presence inside Syria, inside Iraq and inside Iran. Because all these three countries, despite their conflicting interests at times, feel threatened by the Kurdish demand for total, either the establishment of a Kurdish state or for a full autonomy, which is, uh, which is something which is looked at uh, very, with great deal of suspicion by all these three countries. So I think ultimately what's going to happen is that the Kurds who have been driven out of their safe zone uh, because the ISI controlled, uh, uh, they were controlling prisons and things like that, and then they will have to come to terms with the uh, Bashar al-Assad government. So Bashar, it's up to the Bashar al-Assad government whether they, it would like to, uh, to formulate, uh, to use its newfound alliance with the Turks against, the, against Turkey to push Turkey out of the safety zone or he would tell the Kurds that you, know, you have to accept your fate and you have to live peacefully and you, know, you shouldn't be engaging in these uh, separatist activities uh, which, uh, which threaten uh, Turkish interests. So, uh, so, in other words, the Turks, uh, uh, the Syrian Turk, uh, Syrian Kurds have to accept the reality that they have to live within the framework of Syria and the, uh, the Kurdish autonomous movement, which has been the, uh, the uh, potential national security challenge for Erdogan. Uh, I think as a result of this agreement between, uh, agreement yesterday, he has consolidated his control, at least for the time being. But you should not underestimate Kurdish, uh, uh, Kurdish 
population's resolve to even though they right now they feel betrayed by the Americans, but then you know the, the their movement for autonomy, uh, which goes back to the first Gulf War, uh, remains very much alive. All right. Now, sir, coming back to this Afghanistan issue. Now, <clears throat> Pakistan, Russia, China, and USA again will meet to sort of see what they want in in Afghanistan. We always say that it should be one led, one owned. But obviously, there are certain constraints and issues as well. Now, sir, it seems that the Indians are on a back foot as far as their influence is concerned in Afghanistan. Pakistan is playing a very vital role, a very important role. Plus, the Russians, I mean, wherever there is a conflict or wherever there is a problem which can affect Russia in one way or the other, they are trying to sort it out on an immediate basis. You talk about Americans, sir. Now they, plan, they have almost 14,000 troops there and they want to... Uh, take out almost 5,000, 5,500 mm -hmm. and would keep around 8,500 there just to look after the operations and, and, and uh, primarily uh, that sort of work. And when it comes to uh, the Chinese, obviously, sir, they're looking at uh, Afghanistan from a very different prism, from a very different perspective. Maybe economy is the priority for them. And obviously, that will come only when there is peace in the region. And the first visit in the official capacity of Mr. Asper as the uh, U.S. Defense Secretary, sir. Held a couple of important meetings, went back. And obviously, the role of uh, Zalmi Khalildad cannot be undermined either, sir. He is putting uh, a lot. Uh, and, and at the same time, having said that, I think uh, this is going to be a challenge and a half uh, as far as the diplomatic career of Mr. Zalmi Khalildad is concerned because I think <laughs> that is going to be the final achievement or the final disaster for him, sir. I'd like to go back to Turkey for a minute. You're looking at a new evolving Middle East order. And that in that you see the northern Middle East, that is uh, Iran, that is Syria, and go, going beyond into uh, Eurasia to Turkey and Russia. These are forming one big block uh, with the... With, uh, even the Iraqis in between, Iraq that is sandwiched between Syria and Iran, it also has a pro-Iranian government. So this entire bloc is evolving into, with the, with the Turks uh, 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 kind of uh, um, buying S, S 400 missiles and they uh, just showing their preference or their, their uh, um, denial of uh, American demands to uh, write off those missiles, I think that is uh, a new block coming up. The same block, when you look at the, uh, the southern part, you see the Israel resurging. And now there's a, there's, a, there's a conference in Bahrain where Israel is going to openly attend that conference. So Israel uh, in the southern part with Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, this the G6 is, primarily. This, this, is, this is becoming another, another, another block. So this is the evolving shape of within the larger uh, uh, rapidly changing global world order, there's also changing the Middle East order. That, that's what you're seeing at the moment. And the forces are aligning themselves. Coming back to Afghanistan, when you look at Afghanistan, uh, the Americans, the US, for, the US government allowed the elections to go, the Afghan elections to take place to pressure as Taliban, that if you don't listen to us, if you don't we'll talk to us, on. we'll still, we're going to stay here and we'll continue the same process. Now, when you say uh, the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Asper visiting Afghanistan, probably Secretary of Defense and he visited the first war zone. I, I won't give it much more importance than that. But at the same time, when you look at the... Uh, Sir, the result for the president yes, I'm, I'm coming to that. was supposed to be announced on 19th. Uh, Why there's a delay? Because probably, the last time when there was a delay, we all saw what John Kerry did. Yeah. Are we so looking at probably, something Yeah. So, <laughs> so they, they allowed the Afghanistan elections to take place. Mr. Asper comes and pays his tributes to the, to this, to the soldiers in Afghanistan fighting the war. At the same time, there is an attempt because the 20% the voters that voted overall in Afghanistan, there's a big, big question about its, its uh, legality, about the frauds that have taken place. The, the, the entire process has been described as a, a sham process. So there's again uh, uh, an attempt that before actually the results are announced, there's a coalition government formed, or there's a 
coalition, the, the government formed, where again the same setup. So now the question would be: Last time they gave the presidency to Ashraf Ghani, would it be Abdullah Abdullah this time getting the uh, presidency and Mr. Ashraf Ghani becoming the uh, second CEO. fiddle? So that that is. Kind what of difference a, will it make, sir? Uh, well, it, it does make difference because uh, uh, Ashraf Abdullah Abdullah has uh, much more. Uh, uh, um, hatred or much more resistance for Taliban, for Taliban than probably what Ashraf Ghani would have. So, they're, they're, but I'm not sure. But this is this is the kind of uh, the the arrangement, arrangement that is to take place in Afghanistan. So the 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 question would be who is going to be president amongst the two leading leading candidates. So that is probably at the moment going on. When you talk, look at the uh, larger talks. I think uh, Zalmay Ghalilzad uh, came to the region recently and he is uh, just looking at the pulse that uh, what's going to happen. Primarily the talks, they should start, maybe should have started a week back, but they're waiting for something to emerge in Afghanistan. Because unless there is a, uh, a stable government in Afghanistan, which is put in legally and all the parties are part stakeholders in, in this government, the Taliban sh would say, whom should we talk to? If it has to be Afghan led and Afghan. Uh... But sir, for example, if the Taliban they were not earlier talking to Ashraf Ghani or or they won't be talking to Abdullah Abdullah for that matter. But what if they form the government, sir? I'm just giving you an example. Whom are they going to talk to then, sir? Wait for another four years for the next election? No. Uh, or carry out the sort of uh, you know no, uh, engagement, the the hostile see, engagement for, they have for, with the for the forces ta for Taliban. They won't like to wait for another five years and keep on fighting or they won't like to have no government in Afghanistan and still uh, uh, not being able to share the, uh, the the seat of power in Afghanistan. It is in their interest that somebody represents the other parties in Afghanistan, whether it is Abdullah Abdullah or whether it is uh, Ashraf Ghani or Ham Hamid Karzai, anybody who can come and So you don't them. see much changing in Afghanistan, sir? No, you, you or or see, maybe, maybe, maybe the strategy in, in the uh, capital next, market, which we call the wait and see strategy is actually weeks, applicable Next here. couple of weeks, next couple of weeks are important, important? Mm -hmm. are important. And in the meantime, the major stakeholders, China, Russia, Afghanistan, and uh, Pakistan, uh, China, Russia, uh, and, and uh, Pakistan probably would sit down together and they are in in almost agreement with what the Americans are doing. They All haven't right. opposed that. All right, so you will see the government, one government forming in the next two to three weeks, and then probably talks will take place. So that is going to be the first step. Now, sir, uh, another very important aspect is about the intra afghan dialogue, sir. A lot of analysts, a lot of columnists, a lot of writers, intellectuals, they do believe that unless and until that intra afghan dialogue is held, and it's true spirit, sir, everybody should sit, sort out their issues, at, or at least come up with some sort of a remedy, sir, for Afghanistan and then move forward. But unfortunately, that isn't taking, uh, uh, I mean, I don't see that uh, happening in the near future, at least. Sir. I think, you know, uh, Taliban are to blame to a great extent for that. Why? For two reasons. Number one, when these negotiations... But the Americans called off the talk, sir. No, but attacks were going on. Ideally, Taliban should have stopped attacks. Um, you know, the agreement was almost completed, but still they kept attacking. So probably the Taliban would, were thinking that if they kept their pressure, probably the Ashraf Ghani government and uh, the United States will be forced to accept uh, Taliban's demand. So this is, this is one. And number two, Taliban's refusal to talk to Ashraf Ghani at all. They are not even recognizing them. They, they say that, you know, we won't sit, we won't talk to them. And the intra Afghan talks that you are talking about, cannot take place unless they sit together. So now this delay in elections, I see, you know, two um, possibilities and two factors behind it. Number one, maybe because the two front runners, uh, though the uh, results are still not out, but probably the two front runners are still Ashraf Ghani and um, Abdullah Abdullah. And uh, some observers are saying that probably before uh, announcing the results, they want probably the Americans and those uh, allied forces who supported these elections, they probably want some assurance from whoever becomes the president that they, how will they include Taliban in the government? So now, you know, what is the future? The future, if uh, Ashraf Ghani or Abdullah, Abdullah want that they won't talk to Taliban and Taliban will not be included in the government, the peace will not come. If Taliban keep insisting that we won't talk to Ashraf Ghani or Abdullah Abdullah, again, peace will not come. 
So what is the solution? The solution is the same as you said, intra-Afghan dialogue. And that intra-Afghan dialogue can be facilitated only when these all parties, they decide that Afghanistan is our country. If America or allied forces, they want some peace and negotiations, let's sit together rather than insisting that we won't talk to Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah. Let's sit together and reach a conclusion somehow. Because complete government, I don't think, no matter what Taliban do, America and NATO will not allow complete takeover or control of Afghanistan by Taliban. At the most, Taliban can claim a couple of ministries in the government. So if, if that happens, but what Taliban want, apparently Taliban want complete outing of both Ashraf Ghani and uh, Abdullah That Abdullah. is not going to happen, sir. That is not going to happen. And if that is not going to happen, again, you know, they have seen 40 years of bloodshed from 1979. And, and they say they can, they can go on for another 40 years. That's the way they think. Well, I, I feel for Afghan people and this whole region, uh, they, have, they have seen so much bloodshed, you know, my heart bleeds. But um, somehow, probably they don't agree. And unless they agree, the peace will not come. So probability of an agreement between these two, sir, the government of Afghanistan well, and the Taliban. Do you I, think the change will matter no, no, or it won't? I have a different take. Uh, in July, sir? in Doha, there was a specific session which was devoted to the intra-Afghan dialogue. And there was a 23-point agreement, a joint statement that was issued by civil society members, which also included representatives from the, from the Taliban. It also included representatives uh, in their personal capacities from the Afghan government. And they uh, came up with a blueprint for peace, in which there was a call for reduction in violence. That's a substitute word for a ceasefire agreement between the, between the two countries. So there, was a, there were several common points of agreement which were, uh, which were uh, adhered to, which were agreed between the two sides. And they came up with this statement. And I think that offers a very good framework for, to advance the uh, intra-Afghan uh, peace dialogue. Now the question, the critical point, <laughs> the critical stumbling block is that the, the Taliban's insistence that they will not talk to the uh, to the uh, Ashraf Ghani or whoever is the next president or the or the next government in Afghanistan, unless and until Americans announce their uh, their time frame for the withdrawal of the troops. And interestingly, just before Asper's visit to uh, to Kabul, the Americans had quietly pulled out two thousand of their troops from inside Afghanistan. So their troop level is now not 14,000, is, uh, is roughly about 12,000. And I think that was a significant concession which indicated, which signified to the Taliban that their demand for the pull out, total pull out of the American troops. 100% withdrawal, that's what they're looking at. But then the, the, the Taliban have to demonstrate their seriousness by uh, reducing level of violence inside Afghanistan and they are not willing to lay down their arms and they continue to think that they can talk and they can participate in these negotiations and the critical factor would be the uh, October 25th meeting in, in Moscow mm -hmm. which, which, which are the four party level talks uh, between Afghanistan, uh, China uh, and, uh, USA, uh, Russia. and USA and, 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 uh, and Russia. So, as a result of this, I think there is a, enough momentum now for the two streams, intra-Afghan dialogue as well as the, uh, there is a regional consensus now which is now building up. So, so I sir, think the, uh, everything is not lost yet. Sir, sir one, one quick, quick comment because I have been told that we are totally out of time. But one quick comment from all of you, sir. Uh, on one side, the Russians really want that peace should prevail in the region. The Americans really want to pull out. He is looking at the next election, the president. Mm -hmm. And let's suppose if he, if he uh, doesn't, because if the situation isn't conducive or isn't supporting, one, one scenario. And the other is that let's suppose if there is a government formed and the Taliban are happy with certain ministries and they're ready to work together with the, with the government of Afghanistan. And if there is no conflict for that matter, then there is no point that the American forces would stay there. So quick comment on that. Uh, I, will, I will take only 25 seconds. If the power sharing arrangement between the Taliban and the Afghan government has to take place. For that, there must be a negotiations between the 
between the two sides and we still do not see any possibility of that happening. If Abdullah Abdullah is in power, do you think he'll be able to have positive negotiations with the Taliban so that the American forces leave? Because this is what everybody wants at the end of the I day. I think sir. a change would be better because Ashraf Ghani has failed. So probably if, uh, I hope, uh, only time will tell, but I think that Abdul, Abdullah Abdullah will be slightly better choice if he comes. He will try to change situation. That's I what Khan Saab said about Narendra Modi also. But let's see, <laughs> sir. If my recollection is correct, then there has to be a second rerun between the front two runners. They have okay. gone demand. The second phase of second election. Second phase. Mm -hmm. It demands that there is a rerun between the first front two runners. So there is one more phase of elections uh, is has to take place before any government forms there. And if you recall last time when these two were the front runners and one blamed the other, the other blamed the first one and they both became in power. Eventually, to reach that state, they still have to go through one more phase. So I am not seeing very uh, the 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 Afghan uh, intra-Afghan dialogue taking place very uh, soon. Mm -hmm. When you talk of the intra-Afghan Talib uh, talks at Doha, uh, nobody guaranteed the Afghan side, the society, Afghan society at large. They didn't have the power to represent the the entire people. The power resided with <laughs> they the were almost taking 260, yeah. 70 people <laughs> so in the delegation. I remember. think we we are looking at. Trump still has one more year before the November, uh, next November elections. So mm. he has to do everything so that just right in time that wars are taking place, the Afghan uh, imbroglio is resolved and the troops have started to pull out. All right, let's see, sir. Well, I think well, the, the most important, uh, yes, I would sir. like to add one thing more. more. Trump is totally consumed by his own impeachment hearings, yeah. impeachment process. He so has he, his own so, domestic so issues. He, yeah. he has his own domestic issues. Oh, That's yes. going to be a critical variable which is going to affect the American approach towards these conflict zones, including Afghanistan. I think there is going to be under a lot of pressure also. But anyway, Dr. Saab, thank you very much. Thank it was you. a pleasure having you, sir. Abraham Saab, it was a pleasure, sir. And that's all we have. Sir, I'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow at 8. Uh, till then, you take good care of yourself. Khuda Hafiz from our side.